Kirk, a lot of people are glad to see you back, and it looks like you uh, turned into a Doberman since I last talked to you. Yeah, that's, oh, got, that's my, uh, that is my uh, Black Lab. That's, I oh, took her Black to Lab. Square. Okay, yeah. much more gentle. I, I took her to Times Square a few years ago and let her off the leash, and I just let her talk to people. Oh, yeah, she did some great interviews. You know, you know, uh, Kirk, that my psychiatrist diagnosed me as a dyslexic agnostic insomniac. You know <laughs> okay. why? So you don't sleep. You talk backwards. What no, else? yeah, because I'd stay up all night wondering whether or not there was really a dog. Well, yeah, there is. Well, I think God <laughs> had his best day when he made them. So anyway, yeah. are you like me? Do you like dogs more than people? Um. You know, it depends on, the, depends on the person, right? <laughs> oh, depends you're so person. diplomatic. All right, I, so let, let's share your screen, buddy. I, uh, Steve, right. uh, Steve's interested in your, your oil view, which I think he's going to be surprised about. So uh, okay. you want to start with the uh, spider? Okay. Yeah, so I just, because you were just talking about it, I thought I'd throw my spider chart up there. Okay. Um, so, you know... I don't do as much short-term trading as you guys, uh, but I, I do look at these big trends. And there's a couple of different channels here, long-term channels you can look at. I think the one outlined by the red lines, the red parallel lines is probably more correct than the purple lines. But in this age of super low interest rates and perpetual infinite uh, to the edge of the galaxy, to the moon, whatever, yeah. uh, QE, Maybe maybe the, it is the upper channel. And, you know, over the last 30 years, I've noticed that the market likes to run to round, shiny numbers. And it seems to me that we're probably going to make a run to about 500 on SPY. And I don't know if that's imminent in the next year or so, or if it's going to take some time with some getting pulled back before it gets up there. But I think it's going to take a very long time to break above this level. So I think that we could see once we get to around here, around 500 on SPY, I, I think we could jitterbug around there for the better part of a decade. And there's, there's a whole bunch of fundamental reasons why, but ultimately what we know is that the markets, time eventually fixes valuations, a combination of price coming down, earnings going up, uh, rotations out of the- If I may add Kirk. Time and inflation fix valuations. Yep. Right. So I think that that's all coming. You know, that's just, not an unusual number, uh, Kirk. I mean, I don't know how you oh, you came up with it with what fib extensions, um, but I know some uh, real good traders that after a, a pretty big correction are looking for fifty two hundred SPX. Yep. So, um, you know, sometime in like uh, 2023. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, nice look. Uh, I, I, you, I first put this ch chart together in 2015. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you, are you certain to, do you feel like we're close to some type of, um, you know, we're in a melt up stage where we could get a pretty um, severe, uh, more than 10% correction? I have told my subscribers that I think that starting probably in June, market starts to jitterbug a lot more, a little more choppiness, you know, more than we've seen lately. And ultimately, by the end of the year, you probably get another year end rally unless there is some narrative, some event, some policy that, that drives it the other way. You know, we know that the super wealthy home offices are sellers. Um, but we know that the institution. How do you know that, Kirk? Is, so if you read uh, Institutional Investor Magazine, they put that out twice a year, uh, okay. what the family office's asset allocation is. Yeah, I think it's one of the more important things to follow, actually, on stocks. Uh, because the, the, the super wealthy, you know, your 1% investors who own businesses that are 8, 9, and 10 figures, um, you know, they're pretty diligent about managing their money. My family so, office, we're mainly buying groceries. Yeah, yeah, you and me both, right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, so that's interesting that they're um, they're lightening up up here. Um, 
Okay, so we have your view on the on the stock market. June, you know, uh, I know you don't pay attention to GAN stuff like the change of the seasons, but really this recent wave in the market really kicked off in a big way in April. So yeah. the market's having a great spring and spring doesn't end until what, June 21st or so when yeah. we get to the summer solstice. So, you know, maybe we're yeah. at uh, 4,400 by then. I actually do take a pretty big look at seasonality, and I even have a buddy who's uh, over in Spain, I think he is, a European guy uh, who I met online through uh, Cody Willard years ago, and uh, he follows the lunar cycles. And it's, okay. it's, it's been amazing to me how, how accurate those are. I mean, your day-to-day -day trades don't work, but your seasonal trades using the lunar cycles, I was like, yeah. how, how can this... How can this work out so so well so often? So well, because there's lots of lunar ticks out there. Yeah, lots of right. right? And right. we have an eclipse tomorrow. So Do we? yeah. There so you, you know, uh, blood moon. Ariel saying so. Wow, a blood moon. Uh, let me ask yeah. you before we get to something. Uh, your the other instrument you want to talk about just quickly. Uh, your feeling about what's happening. We used to talk a lot about Iran. And, right. um, you know, uh, the fact uh, this recent uh, conflict, um, uh, you know, that's seasonal, too, uh, between the Israelis, the Palestinians and um, uh, Hamas publicly stating, even though everyone always knew that Iran sent them upgraded missiles uh, and having some trouble, uh, President Biden getting back into those nuclear talks. Um, any feeling about uh, any geo risk with Iran coming? Um, up? You know, I, I said this so long ago that I figured things would come to a head with them. Um, we'll see. I, I, okay. I think that at this point, you're probably going to get an Iran nuclear deal signed, sealed, and delivered this year. And that's going to start bringing more oil onto the markets. And, okay, and I so think that's, that's a great deal. Yeah, that's a great segue for what you wanted to talk about today, and you'll be able to answer uh, Steve's question. So, uh, oh, you want to talk dollar too? Okay, well, go ahead. Yeah, we don't, we, I don't know that we have enough time, but, uh, you know, this will be... Well, as uh, long as you get to oil. Yeah. But um, go ahead. This is interesting. So I, I, I just had an interview with uh, Dr. Sean Stein-Smith, and we talked um, the future of the crypto dollar and cryptocurrency and... The flippening, I just sold all my Bitcoin a few months ago and I started buying Ethereum uh, last week because uh, I had a limit order in a 2000 and I woke up one morning and I, I owned it. So, uh, you know, we don't want to spend any time on this, but if you're interested in what we talked about, you know, there's a there's a, a webinar out there you can watch. And he is, you know, he's on the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. This guy is crazy informed. So okay. it, it's real good information. And then all dovetails into the dollar, which dovetails into oil. So okay. been charting the dollar forever, just these big macro trends. And, you know, you have these zones, you know, you have this Goldilocks zone where the dollar, um, you know, doesn't hurt the economy and, and really kind of helps it. So the dollar has been coming down, the market's been rallying, you know, we've been right. getting a bit of a recovery. But if the dollar gets too low, um, you kind of have this support zone in here where it, once it gets in here, you're kind of in a danger zone. You're like a, you know, danger Will Robinson. If the dollar gets too low, lots of bad things can happen. And we've seen uh, that when the dollar really got too low, you have a financial crisis. So I, I told uh, my subscribers, oh, I don't know, two years ago, three years ago, whenever this happened. I said, when this happens right there. That was 2018. Uh, yeah, 2018. You know, you have to be very wary because if it doesn't start to stabilize and then gently rise again, you got problems. You got big problems. So we're getting to that danger zone. And I believe that the dollar probably stabilizes in here. Um, but who knows? You know, we've got a Federal Reserve chairman that's going to be changed next February. I think a lot of things will uh, react to that. Um, I, I, I certainly don't, don't think yeah, Powell's yeah. going to stay. I don't think they're going to keep Powell. You don't? 
Well, I don't. I I think it's incredibly unlikely. Okay. When when is its term up? February. Okay. Right. I like that red line you have at ninety five fifty eight because you know a lot of people are looking for a dollar collapse right now on a breakdown out of your sweet spot. Yep. And uh, uh, I think we're closer to a bear market rally low around that sweet spot that could get back to your red line around ninety five fifty, and then we have a. Uh, a major, major bear market. I just think there's one little hurrah uh, that may be spurred on by risk off uh, late summer, fall. So yep. uh, where the dollar gets a pop, but beautiful work, Chris. Uh, really, yep. Kirk. Uh, you haven't seen your charts in a while. And uh, you know, what's I, funny I, is that red line is just the algorithm that figured out where that should be. Okay. I barely know how that works. <laughs> okay. Uh, so. It's an interesting zone. It is. And, you know, in technical analysis, uh, one thing that I've learned in over two decades of doing it, uh, I started doing it in the late 90s when it was totally not popular. Uh, when I, you know, because I was a financial planner, stockbroker, you know, working in an investment advisory office, uh, when that wasn't cool either. And, you know, you try to tell people technical analysis and they looked at you cross eyed. You know, they said, oh, that's all, you know, voodoo magic. You know, like, well, if it, you know, if voodoo is one thing, but if it's magic, it's another, right? Yeah. So the, when things work, you just have to acknowledge, okay, it may be over my brain level why it works, but it works. And it works such a high percentage of the time that, you know, as a semi-pro poker player, I'm actually playing a lot of professional poker this year. Um, you're just trying to put the odds on your side over and over and over again, knowing that sometimes it won't work out, right? Sometimes you lose yeah. the thesis, yeah. but if you put the odds on your side over and over and over again, it, it, it works out. Well, I, I think when you look at the dollar down here, at some point soon, you probably have to go long the dollar, right? Which yeah. means short yeah. U.S. stocks, um, probably short com commodities, but it's probably a reload point. It's, you know, yeah, it's not yeah. going to be the end of the world thing. Right. That, that's the way I look at it. I could be wrong. Um, ask my ex-wife. I've been wrong before. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So oil, this is the chart of USO. And last spring, you had all of the new traders, the Reddit army, everybody got into the oil trade, right? Because it went down to zero. Uh, yeah. for that hot minute. And, and they jumped into the USO because they don't know how to trade futures, right? They're not like you guys where they know what they're doing. They just bought. You know, I'm going to buy oil. So they bought USO. And they're all bragging now because their USO has done pretty well if they bought down in here. And what we know is that most of them bought in here, right? So yeah. they, they're sitting on a 50, 60% gain and they're bragging about it. Well, I try to tell them that USO is a crap product. They go, no, it's not. I go, well, look, look at this. Well, that was an anomaly. Okay, let's compare it to oil going back further. And then you see the actual price of oil in orange, and then you see yeah. USO, and you go, oh, I don't know what to think about that. But they changed, they changed the formula a little bit over here. Okay, so let's yeah. just yeah. look from the point where they changed the formula. And it's still trailed by a ton, right? That's so interesting. I think that you're probably in a position right now where you have to take a look at Iran and the real supply demand uh, situation in oil. And, and, and obviously timing it is the absolute hardest thing to do. However, we know that the big secular trend is against oil. We know that five years ago, six years ago, um, they flooded the market with oil and they killed over the last six years, about half of the U S oil industry, right? There's about half as many companies now. So a lot of holes in the ground and you have a couple of important players, you know, pioneer uh, resources is, is I think the, the monster there, right? The one that David Einhorn called the mother fracker and you know, I think they're the only U.S. oil company worth investing in. And I, I, there's not another oil company in America that I would invest in. And, and the reason being is that in the Middle East, they have the cheapest oil. 
and they have had to dramatically hold back on production for years now. And they're running into the point budgetarily where they just can't do it anymore. I think the price of oil probably settles in that 40 to 60 range for a very long time. And I think so, we're near the, we're at the top of the range, range here. Yeah, uh, what, 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 what do you say to guys talking 75, 85 here? You know, it could happen as a trade. I mean, there's no doubt that you can get that short-term rally into the summer um, and you can get that trade. And if you get that spike up, that last puff on the cigar, I mean, I, 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 I really don't think I should hear you talking about 100 unless there's a war, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think that there's always the possibility that you can go counter trend. And the counter trend here is that long-term secular decline of oil is real and it, it's accelerating. I was at CES last year and I'll tell you what, all the things that people are talking about today, about EVs and everything else, they were talking about it at, at, at the Consumer Electronics Show last year. And I've sent a number of messages <laughs> over to Ford in the last year and a half, uh, telling them, hey, get on the train of switching over to EV and hybrid ahead of everybody else. And they waited for GM to make their announcement about getting to be predominantly uh, EV and hybrid by 2035. And Ford comes in, backdoors them, waits for the GM announcement that says, well, we're going to do it by 2030. And in Europe, it's going to be by 2026. So the demand destruction in oil is really going to hit hard seven, eight, nine years. And, and, the, and the question you have to ask is, when does the market really reflect that? And what is the, the method of Saudi Arabia in particular, but even the rest of OPEC, uh, because that relationship is clearly fraying, how exactly are they going to maximize their revenue? Do they try to keep the price of oil up by controlling supply, but allowing the American companies to continue to take share? Or do they just say, you know, let's put the final nail in most of the American oil industry uh, coffin and, and, and start pumping more oil and just let all of them but the top six, seven, eight producers die, which is what I think is going to happen. You know, I, I agree with uh, the CEO of Pioneer. I think there's only a half a dozen viable uh, oil companies in America of any significant size. And I think that Exxon is in big, big trouble. I think Chevron's probably going to chop along. I think you see major M&A in that industry, and it's all going to shake out in price. So ultimately- Let me ask you the, what you think of this. Um, lower oil prices- um, are make uh, EVs not as competitive? Wouldn't it be in the interest of uh, the green movement to have higher, even extremely higher oil prices um, to promote EVs and uh, make it a clear-cut case of uh, economics that they're so much cheaper to manufacture and run and the public will run away from having to pay five six seven dollars a gallon for gasoline uh don't you think actually that would be a build the case for evs higher oil rather than lower the problem with that is that you can't win an election when oil is that expensive okay good right? point you, you, yeah. you just can't so so can you get spikes in oil there's no doubt and can you trade those i can't i'm not as good as you guys at that but but you can and I think that if there is a spike of oil here in the short term over the summer, which, you know, I think is, is and if you're saying that it's likely, then it's probably likely, um, then I would take the other side of that bet. And what I told my subscribers last night for the first time, I said, look, sometime this summer, we're going to start betting against oil. And I don't have the gumption to bet on it going up one last time. Okay. But, uh, how are you going to do it? What vehicles? I know you're not going to use uh, USO. Uh, what, uh, uh, well, that's a bullish ETF anyway. Uh, what instruments are you uh, so, looking so at? The best way to short oil, obviously, is use futures, but most people right. don't use futures. And my, I'm, I don't have a futures room, so we use options. And I think the best option for us 
is once oil is really heading, you know, going down the contango way, uh, you just buy puts on USO because USO has the deterioration to begin with and the, and the role. So once we can identify that the monthly role is bad for USO, and then we just buy puts. And the, the drop on USO is going to be fantastic because it's just a crummy product to begin with. So, you know, in a downtrend on oil, whenever that happens, whenever, right, it's in contango, um, we can start betting against USO. Uh, on the future side, what you guys are doing, you know, obviously you're doing a lot of technical trading and you can ride those trends and you're what I would call real-time traders, right? I mean, you don't get into a trade thinking I'll check back in a year. You know, you're, you're checking back every couple minutes. So, right. you know, I think that that is two different types of trading. Obviously, I'm a, more of a position trader uh, that does some swing trading. You guys are swing traders that do day trading. Let me remind our viewers about one of the best live trades ever recorded in face history was during the COVID crash. And um, uh, the metals, uh, GDX, everything was uh, tanking. And you were talking about, you were thinking of buying it. I said, well, look, here here we are. And uh, I said, you know, it looks like a pretty good buy here. And then you said, I just bought it. And that was a bottom for a huge winner. And so one of our attendees remembered that call that you made a year ago. Um, so yeah, right anyway, there. so yeah, <laughs> I remember it. We were on uh, right near the low of the metals uh, during the COVID crash. Yeah. So uh, Kirk has an eye, guys. I'm, I'm just telling you to pay attention to what he's looking at. I know you uh, wanted to talk about maybe a crypto pairing. We have about you know six minutes left if you want to go there. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll 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 expand on that oil trade. So we bought it on that day on air. Sent out oh, yeah, the alert one. within yeah. a minute of me being off with you. Yeah. We tri we trimmed up in here. Yeah. And yeah. you can see where my arrow is. We loaded up right there. Yeah. Again. And it and it's been going up. I, yeah. I actually think that um, I don't know if this chart has my target on here or not. Let's see. GDX uh, uh, going to a yeah. hundred. Well, I, I got it at fifty-five. Okay. You know, but it, it could. You're get using all fibs now, buddy. I've always used fibs. I just never put them on the chart. You know, the, okay. the thing about fibs, like I said earlier, with technical analysis, there's a lot of things that work. Yeah. And sometimes you just have to say, "Well, this is the correlation. This is what works." I mean, sometimes these lines get gravitated to. Who the heck knows why? You know, you, you just start yeah. saying, well, it's some natural thing. <laughs> it's part psychology. It's so many people using it that maybe it just makes it a self-fulfilling prophecy a lot of times. Yeah. Whatever. It, it works more often than it doesn't. Who Don't ask why. So uh, explain to people that may not be able to understand um, how you could have a bull market in gold miners and a bear market in oil when they're both kind of considered inflation hedges. Right. So with gold, obviously it does well in deflation and inflation, depending on whether it's changing direction or, or running a trend. And the long-term problem here in the world for a long time now, you know, for almost 20 years, for sure 12 uh, since the great recession is the long-term trend here is deflation because of demographics and the impact of technology and massive deaths around the world. And they try to fight this deflation with inflationary policy. So you get these central banks who just pour money on the problem. And the reality is that they created a bigger problem, right? They float the market until the market says, you know, this shit is broken. Excuse the language. Right. And, 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 so at some point, you know, that, that's why Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin's main attraction is as a store of value. In this interview with, with Smith, I started talking about the role of money. So what's the definition of money? It's a unit of account. It's a store of value. And it's a medium of exchange. 
Well, Bitcoin has a hard time with medium of, of exchange because not a lot of people are buying their pizza with it. However, it is a store of value because it's scarce. And ultimately, I think that Bitcoin can be seen as a store of value because there's only so many of them. But it doesn't have a lot of utility. And that's the reason why I just flipped from Bitcoin to Ethereum is the utility of, of, of Ether, of Ethereum is just so much greater. You know, you can use it in contracts, you can use it in all sorts of different things. And, and now they're changing the way that um, uh, they, they do the, not the mining, but the, the clearing, I guess, I guess would be the right word um, from proof of, oh, I forget what it's called, but they're, they're changing the way they're, they're doing Ethereum so that it's less energy intensive. Yes. And, 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 it, and it creates a link which is something we talk about in that interview, it creates a link to the traditional financial system. And that's something that Bitcoin doesn't really have. So I, like I said, I accidentally bought Ethereum the other day because I had a limit order at 2000. I woke up and apparently it hit a low of 1966 right at the line basically where I thought it would head to uh, because it needed about a 50% correction. I mean, it just happened to happen. I, you know, right. somebody tweeted something, the Chinese, you know, threw up their arms and yelled, hey, we're commies, listen to us. Yeah. And, um, you know, so everything corrected. I, I do think that Bitcoin goes up quite a bit uh, when the ETFs come online. And that's another topic we talk about. Um, I don't think Bitcoin is the one that owns super long term, though. I think that there's going to be a spike when the financial products get into the market and people start to put Bitcoin ETFs into their IRAs. And then once that rally is done, you gotta be careful. But between now and then, I think there's a heck of a rally coming up in Bitcoin. I think that Ethereum though, is the one that has a super long-term future. Okay, well, it did go through a period of outperformance in the last month or so. After Bitcoin had peaked, uh, Ethereum kept going. Kirk, why don't you let people know uh, the best way to follow you and uh, you're doing podcasts now and uh, et cetera. So uh, right. go ahead. There's uh, Kirk's website. Yep. Just come on over to Fundamental Trends. You can find me on Twitter at, at Kirk Spano. I now also have an alter ego and maybe you'll be able to find that. Um, it's a Unreal Elon Mosk. And oh. uh, I've just been teasing him just because it's fun. Oh, um, okay. And I did create something, if you don't mind. I created a coupon um, for anybody who's watching on Forex Analytics. I don't have a lot of swing traders in my trade room. You know, mainly position traders who would like to do more swing trading. And, you know, I run out of time in the day. So I'm going to make an offer to anybody who likes to swing trade, in particular stocks and ETFs. You want to sign up to Forex Analytics. My most expensive service is called Rare. It's $599 a year. I'll give you $500 off. You have it for $99. Bucks. Just participate in the chat room and help people learn swing trading and technical analysis. So send them your charts. Just show your charts. I, I'm just looking for people who can help populate the, the chat. Uh, with good ideas and a lot more swing trading knowledge than I have. Because I'm good at it, but you guys are great at it. And, you know, what what I've watched you teach people over the last couple of years, uh, Dale, uh, Steve, and everybody, I mean, holy cow. I mean, what what a service you guys have. Well, thank you, Kirk. Uh, It was great to have you back. And uh, people, uh, you know, Kirk uh, has a great eye. No one's perfect. Everyone uh, is wrong at times, but um, you know, uh, I feel comfortable uh, comfortable using Kirk for an intelligence gathering service as well. So, uh, Kirk, uh, thanks again for being here. I think I have you scheduled in September to come back, and um, appreciate you being here today, my trading warrior brother. Yeah, very nice very interview. Much. Thank you very much. That, that code is Forex Analytics. Should be pretty okay. easy to remember. Okay. <laughs> so your website one more time. Uh, fundamental, fundamental Trends. www.fundamentaltrends.com. Yep. There you go. Easy. Okay.
All right, everyone. So that's uh, Turnaround Tuesday. Good hunting the rest of the day. And I'll see everyone tomorrow. Remember, don't just count your cryptos, count your blessings. And we'll see everyone tomorrow. You're welcome, Brock, DJ, Sinatra. Everyone's thanking you, Kirk. And I'll be talking to you soon, buddy. Adios. Yep, you take care.